Good day, dear friends. My name is Ilya Balakhnin, and I am the head of the Paper Planes Agency. Last time we introduced you to the concept of the assortment matrix, the assortment portfolio, and today we wanted to talk a little bit about why companies find it difficult to implement it and how buyer personas, so-called, or jobs to be done in B2B differ from jobs to be done in B2C. Let's attempt to observe how the concept of purchasing motives or the so-called jobs to be done operates in the scenario of the business to business market and understand its significance in influencing buying decisions and shaping the dynamics of the B2B market. For those who are not familiar with the concept, I will briefly explain. Mathematical marketing does not separate marketing approaches from humanitarian approaches to defining customer classification. Humanitarian marketing assumes that it makes sense to categorize clients into certain socio-demographic baskets. And if in B2C it is still possible to imagine some methodological discussion between those who believe that customers should be divided by socio-demographic characteristics based on gender, age, interests, income, and so on, on the one hand, as humanitarian marketers believe, or based on their payment data and choice factors, as we marketers believe, then in B2B, of course, socio-demographic segmentation turns out to be completely useless and relying on whether our decision maker is a 40 year old man or a 28 year old woman with or without children with one or with one higher education loving hip hop or loving classical music turns out to be absolutely useless unless perhaps it can be used in the context of these non-market disputes that is some non-market negotiation processes but non-market mechanisms although we do not reject them are simply not the prerogative of marketing and even more so product marketing management. Anyway, from the perspective of product management logic, when discussing consumption motives at different stages, it is crucial to understand that products at different stages of this model will be purchased and perceived as interesting, important, significant, and slightly different categories by consumers with varying preferences and needs. This understanding is essential for effectively catering to the diverse consumer base. We will not consider the fan base separately here. In this fan base, there can be any people, completely unpredictable. However, we will need to take a closer look at Kegel, Bahn, Tornado, and Main Street. Let's attempt to determine who purchases from us in Kegel Bani, who purchases from us in Tornado, who purchases from us on Main Street. Due to the novelty of the Gelbana product in the market, and its specialized focus on a specific industry, it is crucial for us to target those potential customers who are actively seeking something new and innovative from our offerings. It is imperative that we cater to their needs and provide them with unique value. And who constantly strives to search for something new and is not just a geek? Well, admit it, this is the person who expects to gain some advantages and benefits at the expense of something new, which he could not get before. We will refer to an individual who is oriented towards advantages and benefits as the economic buyer in the subsequent sections of this document. Essentially, an economic buyer is someone who exchanges money for money, purchasing currency in return for their own funds. This is such a fundamental and timeless cornerstone of any deal, actually. For instance, in business to business with a decision maker who is interested in obtaining additional funds, possibly in an implicit form, possibly heavily delayed, perhaps expressed in some business indicators, which he can unambiguously link in his mind with changes either in the structure of costs or in the size of revenues. Money always purchases money. In this regard, in the negotiation process with an economic buyer, one of the key strategies is the strategy of the so-called total cost of ownership, which refers to the overall expenses associated with owning a product or service over its lifetime. You will also become familiar with this topic during the course. My fantastic colleague Andre will refer to it as total cost of ownership throughout the program. What is the meaning? Let's try to understand on a simple example. Assuming we have a certain product priced at 5 rubles, it is obvious that the purchase of this product or service incurs ongoing costs in terms of money, time, intellect and other resources. These expenses do not come to an end highlighting the need to consider the long-term implications beyond the initial cost of the product or service. When I buy, for example, a printer, I need to buy cartridges for it, invest in its repair and maintenance, account for some defects, etc. So, in addition to the cost of the printer itself, let's say 5 rubles. 
I will have some expenses coming up on the horizon for a number of years. Well, let's say another five rubles or so, give or take. When it comes to interacting with an economic buyer, having a healthy approach and an unhealthy approach can make a world of difference in the outcome. The two approaches are inherently distinct and yield contrasting results. Companies that either lack knowledge in working with economic buyers or companies that perceive their products as too mature for such communication will generally seek to reduce the cost of the product in an effort to minimize expenses and save money. While someone sells a product at the market for 5 rubles, they try to offer the market a product, for example, for 4.5 rubles. With a half ruble, companies that work effectively with economic buyers will adopt a slightly different strategy in order to maximize their sales and meet customer needs. They can not only not optimize the cost of the product itself, paradoxically, they can even increase the main cost of the product, say, from 5 to 6 rubles, because they receive all this money and they do not receive all the other components of the total cost of ownership per hour. However, by raising the cost of their product, these companies endeavor to establish procedures for servicing this product, its technical equipment, operation, and so on. To minimize these additional elements of total cost of ownership, let's assume a reduction of 5 rubles, for example, up to, for example, 3, and in this configuration, it turns out that although the consumer pays 20% more for the product, not 5 rubles, for example, but 6, nevertheless, paradoxically, the total cost of economic ownership decreases for him from 10 rubles, 5 plus 5, to 9, 6 plus 3. That is, as we can see, in fact, we are at 11%. This is a really illustrative story and situation. This gives rise to a very important and interesting task. This task is associated with the accurate identification, for instance, through in-depth interviews of all components of total cost of ownership during processes such as interviewing our potential clients, current clients, and clients of our competitors in order to ensure comprehensive understanding. Therefore, these 5 rubles and 3 rubles, both of them, comprise various sub-factors that hold varying degrees of significance for the decision-maker, making them crucial considerations in the decision-making process. And the research we conduct concerning products in the field of marketing, obviously, should be aimed at establishing all the components of total cost of ownership that the decision-maker looks at during the decision-making process. An important question emerges here. How can they be evaluated during an interview if, in theory, as if the number of variations of these components of total cost of ownership is huge and assuming that our respondent will honestly name everything during the interview is quite difficult? In this situation, we are being aided by a remarkable model, which is now visible to you on your screens. This is the model of the Bain Pyramid. We will definitely attach it later with additional materials for downloading to this video. For the moment, you can just look at the screen and see that this model emphasizes the primary elements of the total cost of ownership. They, as you can see, are grouped by tiers. And inside some tiers, there are separate groups of these components. At the bottom tier of the pyramid are the components that are mandatory, without which the deal is most likely not going to happen or be finalized. Slightly above are components that are more significant for technical buyers, such as, for example, the capability to integrate with an existing technological circuit or availability. And a bit higher are the factors important for economic buyers. At the top, there are already more personalized factors, depending on the characteristics and inclinations of the person making the decision. So, if you organize the process of interviewing with an economic buyer to determine the components of the total cost of ownership based on this pyramid, you can get a fairly structured representation of which factors are important, to what extent and at what angle it makes sense to present our product or service characteristics, advantages and benefits in order to show the economic buyer that by purchasing our product, even at an increased price, he is actually making an economically justified and beneficial deal in the medium or long term. Simultaneously, be mindful of the skills or approaches that proved highly beneficial during the Kegelbahn phase when engaging with economic buyers. These techniques, which were once valuable, are revealed to be not only ineffective but potentially detrimental during the tornado phase as the primary buyer transitions to the so-called technical buyer.
the individual who is in search of the top recognized standard in the market for themselves. By the way, understanding the logic of a technical buyer sheds light on the reasons for the failure of those products that immediately attempt to attack a tornado from the fan base. The thing is that any technical buyer, for example, a procurement department employee or a chief engineer of a unit has a current functioning technology that works fine for them right here and right now, which they simply don't need to change. You probably all know that IT specialists have a wonderful saying, it works, don't break it. In this regard, unlike economic buyers, they are not so much interested in disrupting the status quo in search of new greater benefits as in maintaining the status quo and better exploiting existing production systems. Thus, the product invading from the fund base into the tornado zone is seen by them more as a threat. And until economic buyers in the entire market adopt this product as the best available standard for themselves, technical buyers will consider it as a threat. So, if an economic buyer purchases money for money, then a technical buyer primarily obtains peace of mind in accordance with the standard certification, etc. This does not negate the fact that communication with a technical buyer should be based on the total cost of ownership, but the components of this total cost of ownership will be not so much financial as related to the reduction of time, product introduction, the need for retraining, and similar matters. Ultimately, at the main saint stage, we are not dealing with an economic or technical buyer, but rather with the end user, the individual who actively engages with our product on a daily basis in their work. Due to the varying needs of end users, which are influenced by factors such as industry, market, profession, workplace features, and more, there is a multitude of subtle nuances and settings that they require for the proper operation of our product. To accommodate these requirements, we must configure our product and incorporate the discussed modifications, including the additional one from the previous session, into our system. So basically, our customers will keep purchasing our product through conventional channels and endorsing it to both technical and economic buyers, but only if we can effectively adjust and customize our product to fulfill their requirements, preferences, and so forth. That is why you should not leave the Main Street area immediately after the walrus is finished. That is the reason why it is necessary to carefully and flexibly study the needs of end users and customize the product for them.